just want to introduce uh, Kayvon, who's a brother and a friend uh, from, uh, from Westgate Church. He's a compassion missions pastor there at Westgate. Yeah, he's uh, been married for 17 years. He's got three children, and he's just a good, good friend. So I want to welcome to you this morning, Pastor Kayvon Tarot. Amen. It is a pleasure to be here with you guys. You guys are the early birds. Way to go. So you guys get a chance to hear some of the stories that I won't be sharing in the uh, main sanctuary for the sermon in a little bit. So they missed out. That's their problem. So uh, <laughs> maybe they'll watch it on video later. But uh, it's great to be here. Uh, as you heard, I am uh, buried 17 years. I have three kids. That's the joys of my life. Love serving in missions and pastoring. I celebrated my 20th year of full-time ministry this, this fall, uh, this September. Um, and I want to begin a little bit with my journey, uh, where I began, where it all started for me. For me, it was about 7,000 miles away from here uh, in the 70s in Iran. The country at that point when I was born and raised was uh, considered a secular, free country for the most part under the Shah, under the regime of the Shah. There were some uh, pressures on people. If you, didn't, if you did said negative things about the Shah, you got in trouble, so it wasn't completely free. Uh, but for the most part, people could worship whatever god they wanted. Uh, there was Muslims, there was Baha'i, there was Zoroastrian, there was uh, Jews, uh, there were atheists, and for the most part, there wasn't a whole lot of conflict between the bunch. I was raised in the Muslim tradition. Uh, my grandparents on both sides were fairly devout Muslim, and they, uh, my grandma was the one who would take me to mosque, so I remember praying in the uh, mosques because they usually separated the men and women in two different sections. There was a big wall in between and so because I was younger I went with the women. I didn't get a chance to go with the men and uh, I'd sit there and kneel on the Persian carpets and pray the Muslim prayers uh, alongside my grandma. Uh, they would play the five Muslim prayers and they would come over to our house and uh, I was a young kid and I wanted to be like the people I was around. You know my dad was always working and I always had a lot of women in the house. My aunts, my you know uh, mom, I had my older sister, uh, my grandma, and so they would pray the Muslim prayers and I, I would do it, but I was frustrated because I was the only one who didn't have the veil. I didn't have this thing called the chador. So I told my mom, I said, Mom, I, I'd like to have a chador. And she goes, Son, men don't wear chadors. That's only for the women. And I said, But I want one, you know? And uh, she says, No, it's inappropriate for men to wear that. And I said, but I really want one, you know? And I pushed my mom to the point of, I cried so long uh, and so hard for my own chador uh, that they actually made me my own chador. They found some male pattern fabric, you know, I don't know, G.I. Joe's on it or, you know, army green. And I think I'm the only person in Iran who ever cried to get a chador, you know? And this was at a time when a lot of the women didn't even want to wear a chador. So, because it went from, uh, you know, Shaheen knows this, but most of the women didn't wear chadors in the 70s. And all of a sudden, there's a revolution and things changed. So, um, uh, you know, I had an interesting upbringing, you know, being raised in a Muslim family. Uh, I wouldn't say extremely devout. I would say pretty nominal in our Islamic faith, as a lot of the Iranians were. Uh, we believed it because it was part of the culture. You had to believe it. There was no other option. They don't give you option two. There is no option for Christianity or Judaism or atheism. Those are taken away from you, usually in school, especially after the revolution. Uh, my parents did fairly well. They had a very good business, and we were raised... Um, you know, economically in a very solid state. We had a nice home, we had cars, we had all the things you could want. I grew up like any other child would in America. I had all the toys, you know, I had my Zorro mask and my Zorro sword I would run around the house, you know, terrorizing my sister with and uh, chasing the nanny around. Um, so I had a very happy upbringing. You know, I, I enjoyed my life in Iran and my parents, uh, like I said, were so successful there was no real reason to leave Iran. But as you know, in 1979, a revolution happened. Uh, it was a revolution brought on to overthrow the Shah to hopefully, believe it or not, it was actually to bring more freedom. The intention was actually initially that there would be more freedoms. Uh, what they didn't realize is with the new Islamic leader coming in, they were freedoms that they did have, even those were taken away. And all of a sudden became a very theocratic country, uh, you know, in the rule of God, and uh, people were forced to wear the chador, um, the women in the streets, if you showed too much of your face or if you were wake up, you could be whipped uh, or jailed. Um, birthday parties uh, between boys and girls, you're not allowed to have birthday parties where both a boy and a girl are present. And if you found out, I know a party that was about 40, 40 children, not children, they were young teens that had a birthday party and they were all whipped as a result of being together in the same birthday party. Now, mind you, there's no alcohol, 
There's no sexual relations. This is just a birthday party. And they were whipped because of that. Uh, so we went from a pretty free society to pretty much um, a very difficult place to live for, for people. And so my family was fine. We weren't uh, very religious. We weren't very political. We had no connections to the Shah. So my parents thought, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll work through this. It's not a big deal. But things did change even another level when the Iran-Iraq war started. Saddam Hussein invaded my country. Uh, that changed everything for many Iranians. And the rockets began to come. The bombs began to fall. I remember helping my mom put some X's on our windows. And I remember asking my mom, why are we putting, we would take these tape and we put X's because the, uh, the glass wasn't tempered. It was the old glass. And so I'm like, mom, why are you putting tape on the window? She's like, oh, everyone needs to do this now. I'm like, why? She's like, oh, it's just a, a new decoration, you know? <laughs> she didn't want to tell me why. And then I remember, uh, you know, because I was home, I was young. And so I said, uh, you know, we started putting tape on the headlights of our car uh, so that there'd just be a little sliver of headlight left. And I'd be like, mom, why are we putting tape on the headlights? She's like, oh, everyone's doing this. It's the new thing to do, in, you know? Uh, and come to realize much later that, you know, in, uh, you need to have lights turned off at night, you know, so if you're driving your car, you don't want to have lights so that the planes that fly overhead don't know where the town is. They try to make it a blacked out town. And so, uh, Tehran, uh, which is a humongous city. And so, I remember doing this stuff, not realizing the ramifications of what's happening around me. Um, I, the thing that, one of the stories that really sticks out in my mind, <coughs> having lived there, was we had a large gathering, a party. Now, parties are a lot of it's family members. So we had all my family over, cousins, and we had the largest house. So we'd have a lot of gatherings there. I'm not sure what occasion, whether it was a birthday or just a, just a family gathering for a dinner. But I remember we're all gathered together having a great meal, and all of a sudden the air raid sirens go off. And when those sirens go off, you got to find one of two places. Go find a shelter, uh, go in your basement, or whatever else you're going to do. But you can't stay in your home. So I remember coming out of the house with my mom and my dad and my aunts and everyone's worried and we're huddling and my dad had recently emptied out our swimming pool. We had a large swimming pool as well. And so he took us out there. Now, mind you, I think it's in the middle of winter, so it's cold, <laughs> but you go out there and we're huddled in our empty swimming pool against the walls, the concrete walls. And, and I'm sitting there shivering. Everyone's shivering. My aunt and my dad are, are fighting at this point. They're, they're yelling at each other as to where the best place is to stay. My dad goes, the pool. And my aunt goes, why? She goes, well, if the bomb falls anywhere outside the pool, we're safe, you know? But then my aunt goes, what if the bomb falls in the pool? Then we're all dead, you know? <laughs> so they're going back and forth. And then my aunt goes, don't you have a basement? He goes, yes, but the basement's not as good. What if the house crumbles on top of us? So I'm hearing this argument go back and forth. In the meantime, hearing rockets and bombs fall from a distance. And I'm thinking, this is like fireworks, you know? This is great, you know, as a, as a young five, six-year-old. Uh, war doesn't really settle into your heart, you know, you don't understand death at that age. And so for me, it was kind of surreal seeing and hearing things, rumblings. I hear my aunt and, and mom fighting, there's a couple cousins crying. And I'm not sure why they're crying, but eventually the cold got to us and we huddled into the basement. So my aunt won the argument that day. But I believe that's kind of the day, the iconic day that really changed my family's life. Uh, they realized after that incident and maybe some other things that happened that uh, they could no longer live there. Now, they're also concerned that their son, me, would one day be drafted into the war. Uh, there was a mandatory draft started at that point. And so, uh, obviously not at that age, uh, but we did come to find out later that boys as young as 12 were uh, taken into the war. 12-year-olds uh, weren't given guns. They were given one or two grenades. Uh, their sole purpose was to run under a tank and set the grenades off on their bodies. Um, and this is part of the atrocities of war. Uh, when they started to run out of soldiers, they said, you know what, we can't afford to lose adult males uh, in that way, but we can afford to lose our children. Um, and that's how sick the war got towards the end uh, when there was almost a million who died in that war. So we did, we left. Uh, we were part of the lucky crew that left. Many Iranians have come in the early 80s for this reason. They left the war, they left the oppression, they left to seek freedom, uh, losing a lot of things. You know, they lost their home, their business, uh, the cars, uh, a lot of their wealth, uh, a lot of them couldn't leave with much, uh, but the clothes on their back, whatever they could carry in their suitcases. My parents were able to get a little bit of the money out. I think they sold their house pennies on the dollar. You know, in wartime, it's hard to sell things, but they were able to get some things out, and we immigrated to Spain. We got a chance to go there, uh, lived there for a year. I learned Spanish. Hola, to anybody who speaks Spanish. Um, I had my first grade in Spain. I actually learned English in Spain, believe it or not. My first, first year of English was in American School of Barcelona. 
So I don't know how I learned, because I didn't know a, a single word of English, and I didn't know a single word of Spanish, but somehow I picked up those languages in Spain. I've since lost most of my Spanish, but uh, English is doing pretty well, I think. Um, so my parents eventually decided, hey, we need to consider what we're going to do for a lifetime. And Spain, for some odd reason, wasn't the place they wanted to settle. Um, they had friends in the Bay Area, uh, Marin County to be precise. And so they said, why don't we go to where our close friends are? Uh, we didn't have any immediate family in the area. We were the first family in our entire history who ever left Iran, uh, ever left Iran. Um, and uh, so we left. We came to America. I remember landing in San Francisco Airport, 1982. Um, I thought America was great because uh, they painted their bridges with rainbows. And so I don't know if you know, uh, uh, not bridges, tunnels. You know, I don't know if you ever crossed the Golden Gate Bridge. The first tunnel you hit has a rainbow on it. Uh, it's actually renamed now the Rob Robin Williams Tunnel. Robin Williams went to my high school and uh, well known in Marin. And so uh, I forget what it was called before, but I'm like, my first impression of America was they paint tunnels with rainbows. This has got to be a good place, right? <laughs> and so, um, so I grew up here uh, as an immigrant child. Uh, we came here legally with visas. We, it was difficult and expensive for my parents to do, the, do it that way, but we did. Uh, we came on student visas, so we were students. My parents came on work visas, and they were working uh, odd jobs here and there. You know, my dad was running a factory of, of uh, hundreds of people, uh, making tremendous money in Iran, and he came to America and uh, started an import-export business, but just had to, create, uh, had to get a day-to-day -day job, and he uh, founded dry cleaners. You know? So he went from you know, making very large amounts of money and running a company to washing people's clothes. And that was to make ends meet, making maybe fifty to $60,000 a year, a fraction of what he used to make in Iran. Uh, so it's pretty humbling for him. It's very difficult for a lot of immigrant families to fit in and to understand why uh, these things happened to them as well. So I grew up and, you know, being the, the dark-haired, uh, dark-eyebrowed uh, child at school uh, with the funny name, you get made fun of, you know. Now, not that other kids don't get made fun of, but I got made fun of. Uh, people would call me various names. They would, you know, camel jockey, or you know, they had uh, various names for Iranians. Uh, oil herder. I don't know how you herd oil, but I guess I, there's a way of doing it. Um, you know, and I remember talking to my friends. I'm like, I don't even know what a camel looks like. You know, I lived in Tehran. You know, <laughs> people don't realize that Tehran's an industrial city, right? I mean, it's it's like San Francisco. Like, there's no camels in San Francisco. The first time I met a camel was at the San Francisco Zoo, right? So, <laughs> oh, that's what they're talking about, you know? <laughs> so there's this impression of uh, all Iranians being like uh, desert dwellers. I'm like, I've never even seen a desert, you know? We, there's no such thing as desert in Tehran, right? This is a, you know, buildings. That's all we had was buildings. And so, you know, I came here right after the Iran-Iraq War. So Iranians were all considered terrorists. Uh, not just the Iran-Iraq War, but also the Iran hostage crisis that you guys heard about. Um, I mean, 444 days, the U.S. Embassy workers in Iran were held captive. Uh, they were treated well. They had lots of kebab and tea, I heard. Uh, but uh, as far as prisoners go, I think they were probably the best treated prisoners in history. But even still, they weren't allowed to go home. And so it was wrong. And as a result of that, those Iranians who lived here faced some of the persecution of that. I, I was young. Again, it wasn't too heavy. It was words um, made fun of because of my culture, my background, my name, my looks, my hair. Uh, but there were some who did appreciate and, and like who I was. Started making friendships here, we began to uh, grow here. I began to want to become more American and wanted to learn the language well. I did, uh, after three months of ESL, they kicked me out and they said, your English is good enough, go. You know? <laughs> so I got into the regular classes soon afterwards and um, you know, it was difficult, I would say. You know, the, I had two cultures I was warring in my heart. One from the old culture, you know, my dad wanted me to be Iranian and speak Farsi at home. And I wanted to be American, and I wanted to speak English at home, and so it was difficult. I remember, you know, many times talking to my sisters or somebody in the house, and all of a sudden a shoe would hit me in the head from across the room. I'd be like, "What in the world?" You know, I'm like, "Ow!" And I goes, "No English in the house." You know, and I'm like, "You know, what what child gets hit with a shoe because they speak English in the house in America?" I mean, it's just not a common thing for you guys, but you know, these are things that immigrant families have to deal with, right? And I got so angry at my dad, and made me even more bitter at him and the culture that I came from. Uh, that I had to live this dual life. Um, and faith, when we came here, for me, I would still continue to pray uh, on my own. Uh, we didn't go to mosque. There wasn't even a close mosque to where we lived. But, um, you know, I, 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 I wanted to believe there was a God. I wanted to believe that there was something uh, after this life. And uh, I would pray uh, honest prayers to God. And um, I didn't hear many times things back. I, I felt like it was a one-directional prayer to, to God, to Allah. 
Uh, but I didn't want to give up on him. I, I believed there was something more to this life. And I stayed fa faithful till about junior high. And then even then, uh, my faith began to wander and go in different directions. Um, and I wondered, maybe we're made it up. You know, if there is a God, why would he cause this war in my country? Why would we lose all of our money and all of our uh, things uh, in Iran? And uh, I got angry for having missed my family. Where are my cousins? Where's my aunts and uncles? How come I don't have family near me? Everyone else has their families near them. And this bitterness caused me to wander away and walk away from God. Uh, I would say late junior high, probably around you know, 12, 13, <coughs> 14 years old. And um, it was around this time that um, a friend of mine uh, at my freshman year of college, a friend of mine comes to Christ. And a uh, very, very powerful conversion. And they began to witness to me and ask me to go to church. And I'm like, are you kidding? You know, this is crazy. Why would we go to church? And so there's this you know, fight between us. But... They forced me to go and, you know, through friendship, and so we did. I went, and so, um, you know, I, I began to listen to the things in church, but I just didn't understand. I, it was almost like a different language. You know, the Bible says, you know, to those who haven't heard, their ears, you know, their, their eyes are blind, their ears have been deafened. And I felt like there was this deafening uh, because of Islam, because of my culture and background, uh, that there was definitely demonic powers uh, preventing me from hearing the gospel. And so I tried, but it was kind of this just weird that they talked about God as if he was here in the room, and they would sing songs as if, you know, they're celebrating him, and just, it was a little odd for me. So I didn't accept Christ. I, I rejected the, the faith early on my freshman year. Um, then my junior, sophomore, junior year, same thing, just didn't, didn't have any inkling of God or desire for God. My senior year, some things happened, um, and I remember um, I, it was a sports injury, actually. It was actually one of the things that led me back to the church was I had a, a bad knee accident. I had a, I just hurt my knee playing soccer. And I was, uh, it, was, it was bound up and I couldn't do anything. And I came back a little early, hurt it again. And my coach said, you cannot come to the soccer field. You're gonna kill yourself, you know, so you're off. Uh, you can come to the games, you can suit up, but you can't play. And I said, oh, I was so frustrated, I was so angry. But uh, as a result of that, I went home and I told my mom, I said, mom, I'm so bored. I said, I'm so bored. She goes, why? She goes, I just have nothing to do and I don't wanna sit home and watch soap operas in the afternoons with you guys. So what do I do with my life? You know, and she goes, I don't know. And so I said, uh, you know, I was getting ready for colleges. I remember that was my senior year. And I'm like, you know, maybe I'll go to that, uh, maybe I'll go to that uh, uh, church thing that I went to my freshman year. And mom's like, why? You're not Christian. And I'm like, no, no, not at all. And she goes, uh, that's crazy. Why would you even mention that? And I'm like, no, I said, actually, I'm going to college. So maybe I'll put one more thing on my college resume that I went to church my senior year, you know? <laughs> so it was a very selfish reason, actually, not, nothing spiritual. And my mom looks at that and she goes, that's a good reason. That's not, you know, so <laughs> mind you, my Muslim mom saying it's okay to go to church. So I'm like, sure, let's go to church so I can put one more thing on my college resume. So I did. Uh, and I was bored. So I thought, you know, I'll just go there and kill time. It was really just to kill time because I was ADD and I didn't want to sit home at home and do nothing. So I did. Went to the youth group and I began to sit and watch and I was like intrigued and, you know, it's in the back and then, you know, a couple of weeks in, I'm sitting in the middle of the crowd. A couple of weeks later, I'm sitting in the front of the crowd. I'm intrigued by what the pastor is saying. And uh, I began to invite my friends to the youth group uh, to come. And I, I wanted to see them come to know uh, this God because I felt like this was something that was life-changing for people. Um, but I remember it was actually a Christmas Eve party, uh, New Year's Eve party on 1992-93. That uh, So it was a Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve 1992 uh, that... We had a prayer gathering. We had a we had a, a party, and then at five minutes before the end of the time, I the pastor stopped everything and said, "We're going to pray for five minutes before the New Year's. I want you to ask God any question you want and let Him answer it for you." I said, "Okay." And so we <clears throat> closed our eyes, and I began to pray for my friend to my right, friend to my left. God, I pray they come to know you. They don't know you. God, I pray for them to come to know you. They don't know you. And as I'm praying this prayer, I hear God's audible voice, and I heard this a few times in my life, but this is very very loud. And the, the words were, why are you praying for them when you don't know me yourself? And I looked up thinking that the pastor was standing in front of me. And it was that loud. And I looked up and the whole room is quiet. Um, and the pastor's way in the front. So it c clearly couldn't have been my pastor. And I hear it again in my head when I close my eyes. Why are you praying for them when you don't know me yourself? And I said, God, is that you? you know? And I realized that God was speaking to me. He wanted me to come to know him. And so I did. I received Christ in the middle of my senior year um, and uh, put myself, I guess God put me on a journey that went from zero to 60 when it came to faith. I remember um, 
wanting so badly to go to church uh, after that, but realizing if my parents found out that I was going to church, I'd be in trouble. So I'd tell my parents, actually my mom was in Iran, thank goodness, because she always knew what I was doing, but my dad didn't. So uh, I would uh, go to my dad on Sunday mornings and be like, Dad, I'm, uh, I'm going to go study. <laughs> now mind you, this is my senior year, second semester, and uh, no one studies on Sundays, but I, he didn't know that. And so uh, I, I said I was going, and I was being honest, right? I, I was going to go study something, right? I was studying the... Bible, yeah, so I wasn't quite lying. Um, so he thought I was going to the library. I go to church. Now, I don't know how many seniors in high school have to lie to their parents to go to church, but I was one of them. Uh, most seniors in high school try to lie to get out of church, but I was the opposite. I remember going for three months, uh, and, you know, uh, I remember coming home. My mom came home, and, I, you know, like I said, they have like a sixth sense or something. So the moment I get home from church, the, the weekend she gets back, I come home, and uh, she opens the door quickly, and all of a sudden, I'm looking uh, at her, and she goes, where were you? And I'm like, uh, church, you know. I say, Who said you can go to church? I'm like, uh, God, you know. And so uh, she calls my dad, and I thought, great, here comes a beating, you know. So he comes down, what's wrong, what's wrong? And she goes, your son's become a Christian. And so uh, I, my dad goes, is that true? Did you become a Christian? I said, yeah. She goes, uh, why? Who said you could become a Christian? I said, uh, God, you know. And remarkably, my dad said something that was, I think it was uh, almost God was working in his heart in some weird way, um, uh, even though he was against uh, this faith. He said to my mom, he started saying, uh, he started laughing. And my mom goes, why are you laughing? He goes, oh, our child is just sick. He's just got this illness. And my mom's like, what kind of illness? He goes, it's like a cold. He'll get over it in a short time. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And he goes, yes, you know. And uh, he says, I give him one year. I said, in one year, he'll be, he won't be a Christian. And I'm like, well, can I go to the youth group? He goes, yeah. Can I go to church? He goes, yeah. Can I go to the retreat next week? Yeah. Can you go to Mexico in a month? Yeah. And I'm like, my mom's like, wait, wait, we're not supposed to let her Muslim child do this, you know? And, and my dad's like, no, the more we let him do this Christian thing, the less he'll want to do it later, you know? And I'm like, yes, you know, like, God is alive. God is speaking, you know? So uh, I got a chance to do, which is remarkable. Again, most Iranian families would not react in this way. Uh, I'll be honest, a lot of Middle Eastern families would uh, definitely have much more punishments than they, I had growing up. But I was one of the lucky ones. Uh, because they thought I was going to give it up, I got a chance to get deeper in my faith. And uh, I did. Uh, that mission trip, I made some decisions to follow Christ. Some powerful things happened in that Mexico trip that changed my life. Uh, for ministry, um, and part of it was uh, seeing God work and seeing God move and speak that whole week. I remember towards the end of the week, I was just in tears, and I couldn't sit with the group, so I separated myself and went into these cornfields, and I sat there and crying, crying, crying. And my pastor comes up and finds me after a while. He says, Kayvon, what's wrong? Why are you crying? I said, my heart hurts. And he goes, do you want me to call the doctor? And I said, no, not that kind of heart pain, you know? <laughs> I said, my heart hurts because there's a world that doesn't know Jesus, Yet I was given four years, and so many people shared the gospel with me. So many people didn't give up on me, and they prayed for me. Why is it that I had so many opportunities to receive Jesus, yet so much of the world doesn't even hear it once? I said, it's not fair. And he goes, he goes maybe God's called you to be an evangelist or a pastor or, you know, or a preacher. I said, I don't know what those things are, Gary. I said, I just, I just want the world to know what I know that God loves us, that he cares for us, that he died for us. And he says, that's what the gospel is. That's what, that's what evangelists do. And I didn't realize this. this. Again, this was three months of being a Christian. I made this decision that I wanted the world to know this Christ that I knew. Um, so that set me on a different track. Uh, unfortunately for my dad, it, it, it backfired. Uh, I became a stronger believer as a result of those uh, that year. I went to college, UC Davis. I got two degrees in psychology and religious studies. I served in various ministries there. Uh, got a chance to evangelize to the campus and, and uh, to various people, even teachers. I got a chance to witness to certain teachers um, and that God told me to talk to. Um, I just felt I was privileged to have gotten so many opportunities um, from, as a non-believer to, to meet this Jesus. And I didn't understand why so many Christians didn't have the same passion. Uh, I would talk to them. I, and sometimes they didn't even have a passion to follow God. And it was odd for me. Why, why would you come to church and not want God? Like, why would you come to college group and not want God? And then on top of that, why would you have a faith that you never share with anybody else? And this, this I didn't understand. You know, I, I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't understand why you wouldn't want this. Uh, if you have the cure to cancer, wouldn't you want to give it to as many people as possible? Like, that was my thought about Christianity, was that we have the cure for the worst cancer. Uh, we have the cure to AIDS. 
uh, which is a death sentence, you know? Imagine a disease that, that there's a 100% chance of death as a result of it. Um, and why wouldn't you want to give it to other people? And so I saw Christ, my Christian faith as the greatest cure for man. And yet others saw it as, as a side note in their, in, their, in their week, as if it wasn't important as if it was something that was to be done on Sundays and forgotten about Mondays through Saturdays. And so I became a thorn in the side of a lot of Christians. I frustrated a lot of Christians, and I'm glad I did. Uh, I didn't understand why. Why, why. why don't we speak up for Christ in the classroom? I remember a teacher denigrating uh, and just, uh, just saying awful things about Christianity. I remember standing up in the classroom saying, this is wrong. Uh, this is not the Christianity that I know. And I began to preach the gospel in the classroom and I began to tell the teacher what Christianity stood for, you know. And uh, my, you know, uh, the teacher's like, Get, sit down. You know, uh, we had a guest lecturer who was doing it. Actually, it wasn't the main teacher. It was a guest lecturer. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to sit here while a guest lecturer trashes my faith. I said, I know Christianity. I'm a pastor in my church. I can confidently say that I know Christianity better than this academic who doesn't know anything about Christianity. You know, and, my, and everyone's like, ooh, you know. <laughs> Kayvon's going to get enough in this class, you know. And I'm like, I don't care what grade I get, right? And I remember after the class was over, three students came across and said, Kayvon, we're Christians. Um, and one of them started crying. And she's like, I, I didn't know how to respond when the teacher was saying these things about Christianity. Uh, but you said the things that were on my heart. And I said, it's okay. You know, like our grades aren't our ultimate uh, goals in this school. We, we have to live for Christ. We're here on college campus to live for Jesus. Um, so that led to me coming down to San Jose. Uh, I worked at the Iranian church down the road from here in Sunnyvale now uh, for 10 years. Jane and I met through that, one of your uh, members here, and got a chance to get to know some great people. Uh, I, I saw that you guys recently had uh, Gilbert Hosepian here as well, uh, speaking, and he's a friend as a result of me working there. His dad, uh, being martyred, was one of the people, you know, he gave his life for the gospel uh, at a time when a lot of uh, Armenians and Assyrians weren't sharing the gospel to Muslims. And actually, in Iran, uh, Armenians were just told, just, 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 we're happy to be Christians, you know, let the Muslims be Muslim and don't bother. For many, many years, many centuries, that actually happened. His dad, Gilbert's dad, and many others who gave their lives said, no, uh, we're here to make sure that everyone hears the gospel. We're, we're called to love the world. And, and uh, Iranian brothers, our Muslim brothers and sisters, people like me, are the ones that we need to share the gospel with, uh, even unto death. Um, and some people are surprised at the uh, amazing numbers of Christians in Iran and global, uh, globally that, of people who've come to faith. And I say, look, it, it didn't happen magically. It happened because there was believers who loved God and began to love their neighbors as themselves, even on the point of death. And they were willing to give everything for the gospel. So... Um, I'm just going to share one quote, and then we'll um, ask some q and I'm not sure if you guys wrote questions. Did anyone write questions? Raise your hands. Yes, a few, maybe. Or we just do live Q&A. Okay. So if you do, go ahead and pass those questions, and, and then I'll, we'll, we'll even do some live ones. But Henry Nouwen said this, We become neighbors when we're willing to cross the road for one another. There's a lot of road crossing to do. We're all very busy in our own circles. We have our own people to go to, our own affairs to take care of. But if we would cross the road once in a while, and pay attention to what is happening on the other side, we might indeed become neighbors. Sarah Miles says this, there's no way to be a Christian at home by yourself. Now, technically, that's not true. I mean, technically, you could be a Christian at home by yourself. There's, you know, uh, you know Martin Luther and Paul kind of made it clear it's not about what we do, it's not our actions. But, but she is saying something true, that how can you become a, a living Christian? Now, you can be a dead Christian, Sure, at home, but how do you become a living Christian? It's only done in public. You can't not live in public and call your faith alive. So I believe that our faith needs to be lived out in public places uh, to honor God in our lives as well. So I'll stop there. I, know if, I don't know how much time we have left, but I want to... 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Uh, about, uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Did you still want to do the video or not? Um, you know what? Hold... Yeah, I'm going I'm to end with that video. I'm going to end with that. That's a good video, actually. So I, I, wanna, I want you guys to see this really cool video before we end, because I'm not going to show it in the seat. You guys got the special treat, so I'm not going to share 90% of the stuff is not going to be shared in the sanctuary. Um, what ideas do you have about inviting un, unchurched friends into the faith-based rhythm, rhythms of our life? Uh, do, or do you have ideas about inviting people? Um, yeah, it's, it, like I said, uh, we live in a very secular society. We live in a society that... Our, our media, uh, our politicians mostly, uh, are creating rules and laws that go against, counter our Christian faith. Um, we live in a society where 
Uh, unfortunately, people of faith are, are made fun of as unintellectual somehow, you know, because we've become Christians. And, um, you know, they don't look at our fact that we've gotten two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree and a PhD, a doctorate. They don't care what you've done. All of a sudden, you must not be an intelligent person to be a believer. Uh, I would say this, uh, patience, um, perseverance, and love, and prayer. Um, those things, patience, perseverance, love, and prayer, uh, go a long ways in, in bringing people to Christ. Uh, I believe in friendship evangelism. I don't, uh, it's difficult in this society, in this culture, it's difficult uh, to stand on a street corner and preach. It's, it is possible. People have come to Christ, and I, and I believe there is a place for all different types of evangelists. Uh, my evangelism is through friendship, it's through relationship, it's to build bridges with people. Uh, sometimes it's in a format like this where I don't know people, but I get a chance to preach the gospel. I'm invited to, and I'm in, it's wonderful. I was just at Lee High School uh, several times last year preaching to maybe between 50 and 120 kids at one time, the gospel, and many non-believers there, many people uh, questioning the faith. I had about 60 or 70 cards that I had to answer you know, in a 30-minute 30, 30 time frame. It was amazing how many questions they came up with. Uh, about faith, about culture, about Christianity, about uh, all kinds of stuff. So you got to be patient. you got to be persistent. you got to keep inviting. I was invited. Uh, there were some girls. After they saw me come my freshman year, there was these two girls, uh, Sabrina and Emily, who would invite me to church all the time. And I would make excuses. You know, i gotta, I got to clean my room. I never clean my room. Um, you know, i got to rearrange my sock drawer, you know, or what, I, any excuse. I have sports. Sports is my main excuse. I have sports. That's why. They asked me to come again and again and again from my uh, end of my freshman year to my senior year. And I said, no, every time. Hey, we got a retreat coming up, you wanna come? No. Hey, we got this coming up, you wanna come? No. Hey, we gotta go to Mexico, you wanna come? No. Uh, they kept asking, persisting, and they were good friends of mine. And I remember my senior year, when I went back to the youth group on my own, because of my knee injury, guess who the two, first two people who were who charged me and gave me a big hug? Sabrina and Emily, right? They were like shocked. Like, we didn't even invite you this week. Why are you here? You know, <laughs> I'm like, uh, just I just showed up. You know, I'm, don't freak me out. You know, um, so you got to be patient. You don't know. You know, we're we're not called to save anyone. Uh, we're just called to be heralds of the gospel. God's the one who saves, right? We're just called to give the invitation. So don't put the burden of salvation on your shoulders. It's not. Uh, I'm not the savior, and neither are you. But we have to stay faithful. We have to invite um, and pray and know that God can, through dreams, visions, various ways, people can be met. Um, and I have helped some people who've had some dreams and visions come to know Christ, which is pretty cool. Um, do I think that Allah, oh, that's a good question. Do I think that Allah is the same as um, the uh, Christian God uh, or the Hebrew God? Um, the word Allah is a generic word for God in, in, in Islam or in, in Arabic culture, in the Arabic. So Allah is God. So a Christian who comes to faith will still call God Allah. So in that sense, the name is not the problem. Um, is Allah in the Quran the same Allah in the Bible? That's a much more tricky question. So if, if a Muslim or if, a new, if someone mentions the name Allah, just, just know that's, that's the name for God. Um, very big spectrum of beliefs on this. Uh, my personal belief is that they're not uh, the same God. They cannot be the same God because there are too much contradictions between who Jesus was, what Jesus did, um, and the plan of salvation for mankind are two drastically different things. Much of the Old Testament has been changed uh, to fit the agendas of Muhammad. So yes, I believe that Allah is the name for God. I do not believe that the Allah of the Quran is the same as, as the Yahweh we know uh, and the Christ that we know because too much has been changed. We cannot say uh, Christ was Savior um, and died on the cross for our sins in one book and the other book say uh, he's not the Savior and he didn't die on the cross for your sins. Um, we can't say it was Isaac uh, uh, who was sacrificed, about to be sacrificed by Abraham in one book and then say Ishmael was the one who was sacrificed, uh, about to be sacrificed in the other book. Uh, the line of Ishmael runs to Muhammad, and the line, obviously, of Isaac leads to Christ. So um, we, we have some very stark differences, so you cannot say they are the same. In concept, they are, that there is one God. Yes, we believe that there is one God. Muslims believe in one God. We believe there is one all-powerful God who created all things. Yes. Uh, after that, the, the division begins to happen. And there is some overlap, uh, but... Uh, is, it is very, very slippery and dangerous to say that they are one and the same uh, because you are basically contradicting much of what's truth in the gospel and you basically have to reject the gospel in order to say that. 
Uh, what does, who does the whipping uh, is, isn't Allah genderless, isn't, uh, it is sin to ascribe personal attributes to Allah. So I'm just, uh, who does the whipping? Uh, they have different groups of people. Uh, there's the Basij, who are the secret police or the street police. Uh, they're uh, officially, you can be jailed and there'll be the jailers, um, the government, government leaders. Um, but generally it's people who are basically uh, culture police in, the, in our country uh, who try to keep the cultural norms. Uh, sometimes, depending on what year it is, it gets less or more. Uh, right now, maybe it's in a little bit of a more, more free state right now, but uh, there has been times, like I said, just for going to a birthday party, kids have been whipped. Um, and these are not little tiny whips. These are like Indiana Jones type whips. I mean, this is like ones that tear your back um, when you get whipped, so it's, it's pretty brutal. Um, Sure, isn't it a sin to attribute personal attributes to Allah? No, I mean Allah does have some personal attributes. You know, He is uh, in, in 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 the Quran. He's given certain names as merciful and powerful and uh, peace. He's he's given certain attributes. I don't know about personal. Yes, obviously for Muslims, they have the biggest uh, one of the biggest barriers is the Trinity. Uh, how can you say there's three gods when there's only one? Uh, we're a religion of one God. We're Abrahamic. You know, we believe that you know. There is only one God, and Christians, you guys have, have, have perverted it and created three gods, um, which is not true. We believe, it's, we believe in one God in three persons, uh, but it's a little bit, uh, it takes a little bit longer to kind of explain that to Muslims. Um, so a whole different talk I can give another time if you'd like me to come back. But um, yeah, so a couple others, and then we'll stop and we'll pray. How do you encourage a relative not to mix uh, Buddhism and American Indian religion into Christianity? Was Ishmael sacrificed? Um, well, neither Ishmael or Isaac were sacrificed. It was just the, the, the act of, um, act of, of uh, obedience uh, that God was seeking in, in Abraham. So uh, we believe it was uh, Isaac that uh, the uh, Bible predates, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures predate the Quran by at least 1,600 years in this story alone. So uh, when you have, you always want to go closest to the source, right? Uh, someone right now writes that, uh, Hitler was a good man, and he, uh, he, you know, he was a savior for uh, Germany, and he defended against all these uh, oppressors, and uh, he saved the lives of millions, right? Someone could write that today. Was that true? No. You want to go to the closest source to the person who wrote about his life in his lifetime, or as close to his lifetime as possible. Uh, this is just plain old uh, forensics, uh, uh, you know, policing, right, uh, or even uh, uh, just, just the ways you want to go. So the Quran being written, uh, you know, in the six, seven hundreds has, is, is far later than the earliest story. So um, that's one of the things we have to go to. Go to the earliest sources. What do they say? Do they agree? Uh, there's not a single text that I know of that says Ishmael was being sacrificed uh, by Abraham. There's not a single text. Uh, pr prior to Muhammad coming and saying this through visions that he received in a cave or other visions that he received in his life. So, no, I, I don't believe it was Ishmael. It was Isaac. Um, how do you encourage relatives not to mix Buddhism and American Indian religion? That's hard. Uh, that's uh, including animism or other things um, into our faith is difficult. Um, I would say this. Do they know Christ? Is Christ Lord and Savior in their life? That's the key. Uh, you have to go to the core sources. Uh, do they believe that God sent Christ to die on the cross, to, to be resurrected again. Do you believe that he was resurrected again? Have you placed your faith and your sin into Christ's hands as redemption and payment of your sins? Um, the gospel is the core. Then there's the other layers around it. Um, you know, I believe Buddhism is not a religion. I believe Buddhism is a system of beliefs, a system, a way of living. Um, it's, there's no prescription to who God is in, in Buddhism. There's no a plan of salvation in Buddhism. Uh, it's just live a good life, uh, treat creation well. Uh, does that contradict the Bible? Not really. Uh, and a lot of things that Buddhists believe and say, I think, are, are fantastic. It's wait, take care of your mother and father, uh, take care of creation. You know, don't burn every forest. You know, I don't. You know, just not, uh, be be nice to people, right? Uh, take care of the homeless. Take care of the poor in your community. Uh, there's a lot of great things in Buddhism. Um, can you follow some of the Buddhist teachings and still be a Christian? I don't see why not if it doesn't contradict with the Bible. It says meditate. We say meditate. That's great. Let's meditate on the Word of God, right? <laughs> we have a purpose of our meditation. It's not just to make our minds empty. It's actually to make our minds full of God. So if you're going to meditate, just put the Bible in front of you and sit there for two, three hours and meditate. Let's, let's meditate as hard as Buddhists do. Praise God. 
uh, they believe in meditation. I believe in that. I think meditation is something that we've lost. It's a lost art. So find the areas of overlap. Find the areas that it doesn't contradict with the Bible. If there is, then, at, then say maybe this area isn't, isn't biblical. Maybe it's not okay to have uh, a dream catcher because uh, you know, you're believing that this icon or this symbol is going to somehow capture you know, this. What if it captures the wrong things? You know, I don't know. You want to be able to go through the things that are biblical and not biblical. If someone's truly wanting to follow Christ in any way, we want to make sure we clean our house. We want to make sure there's no bondages of our old life into our new life. And so I would say... For me, Iranian, there's a lot of great things about Iran. Do I have to give up the Persian New Year to be a Christian? No, Persian New Year is fantastic. Let's celebrate, you know? But instead of having a Quran on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the table, let's have a Bible on the table. You know, the fish and the apples and all these other things that we put on the thing are fantastic. Bring your culture, bring your heritage into the faith. We need a more beautiful and colorful faith. Don't make it a Western faith. Use uh, your Eastern uh, culture and religion, uh, back, a religious background and bring the best things out uh, but if it contradicts to the scriptures, those are the areas we need to stand up and say, ah, I'm not comfortable with this anymore. Uh, this is probably not right. So, uh, again, it's an individual thing. You have to go through and, and decide, uh, and through the scriptures, decide what is biblical and what is not. Like I said, meditation is biblical. I see it throughout the scriptures. Meditate on the Word of God day and night, uh, you know, and so I believe that there's a place for meditation if you do it in God's heart. I'm going to stop and pray real quick. I think we have to get going to the sanctuary pretty soon. Is that right? So... <laughs> Uh, thanks for this extra time uh, to spend with you guys. And if you have any more questions, feel free to come up and talk after the uh, service. Uh, I live in Campbell. Literally, this is much closer to my house than my church. So uh, I, I'm not too far if you ever need to meet here and, and chat. God, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for the scriptures that change society and change life. Thank you that we can bring our background, our heritage, and our culture uh, into uh, what we believe and how we read your scriptures, Lord. Thank you uh, for those of all backgrounds, Buddhists and Hindus and Jews and Muslims, atheists who are coming to know you. Uh, we pray that our lives can be lives of love. Uh, we pray that our lives can be uh, seen uh, as hopeful and joyful, that people will see that joy in our lives and desire the things that we follow. Uh, God, help us to be wise and stewards of our time and wise stewards of your gospel. Uh, we know it's a precious cure uh, for all of man's ailments, Lord. God, help us to be faithful stewards of what you've given to us to give to the world. Uh, thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for forgiving us. And we just trust our, our lives to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah.